Culture Surge is powered by four anchor organizations, each led by women of color. That includes Harness, The League, the Center for Cultural Power, and Illuminative. We want to acknowledge, um, especially acknowledge and thank Harness, who takes the leading role in providing the backbone support for Culture Surge. I'm really pleased to announce just my, my sister, just someone I have so much admiration for, and our, our first speaker, cultural strategist Tracy Sturdivant, who's the co-founder and president and CEO of The League. Tracy is a political and cultural strategist who works with leaders and organizations to make America a place where everyone can thrive. For more than two decades, Tracy has pushed the envelope with the ideas that ensure our work for social change keeps pace with the changing world around us. She founded the League in 2017 and currently serves as the president and CEO. In 2014, she co-founded Make It Work, a campaign that used narrative strategy, pop culture, and cultural organizing to catapult catapult pocketbook issues like affordable childcare and equal pay out of the home and into America's national conversation. And now I turn it over to Tracy. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so excited to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, so early uh, afternoon for some of you. You know, we are in the midst of two pandemics. One is more recent. COVID-19. And the other is one we've been fighting for years, racial injustice. In 2020, we've seen them collide. The people most impacted by both pandemics are experiencing a perfect storm of instability, economic instability, instability in their health, their families, their day-to-day -day lives, instability created by racial injustice they experience every day, all of it. It's all come to a head this year. We are less than 100 days out from what is unquestionably the most important election of our lifetimes. I know we say that every election, but this time I really mean it. <laughs> if this were a typical presidential election year, we'd be gearing up for in-person conventions right now. Campaigns and organizations would be hitting the streets to talk to voters face to face. We'd be thinking ahead, wondering, what could the October surprise possibly be? <laughs> but as we all know, this is about as atypical a year as can get. Think back to 100 days ago, right? We had no idea that we'd be here today. And it's with that same uncertainty that we look towards November 3rd. Next slide. But in the face of all of this uncertainty, there are a few things that we do know without a doubt. One, Trump is currently trailing in the polls. Recent national polls have Biden up as much as eight points. There's going to be a woman vice presidential nominee on the Democratic ticket. It might even be a woman of color. We know that COVID is going to surge again. In fact, we're still surging and we're not over the first wave and there's going to be a second wave. And most predictions are pointing for it to hit this fall. That means COVID is going to seriously impact how we vote this November. Registering voters and casting a ballot can already be confusing or time-consuming process for some voters, and it's about to get a whole lot worse. People are also afraid. They're afraid of showing up to vote in person, but they're also afraid that if they cast their ballot by mail, it won't get counted. And all of this is going to require clear, trusted information about how, where, and when people can cast their ballots this fall. Unfortunately, the Russians are coming. In fact, they're already here. Uh, the disinformation efforts we've seen in recent years are only ramping up in 2020, and COVID has given them even more angles to exploit. Facebook and other social media companies aren't doing enough to stem the flow of disinformation. And across the country, people are largely stuck at home, cut off from their usual networks and getting their news and information from social media. This is a disaster in the making. And simultaneously, voter suppression is real. Even without COVID and the picture, voter suppression efforts have stolen election in recent years. Think Stacey Abrams in Georgia in 2018. 
With the pandemic, we are only seeing these efforts increase and COVID is going to cover um, the, it's, it's giving the GOP cover to, you know, expand their voter suppression efforts across, among voters of color, women, and other voters that they are afraid of casting their ballots. But in the midst of all of those reasons to worry, there are also reasons to be hopeful. For example, since the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others, people have been in the streets protesting and they are on fire. We can't overlook that that energy exists and it is a defining aspect of this year. So what do we need to do? This is a numbers game, y'all. Simply put, we need to turn out more voters. And if you look at turnout during this primary cycle, we have some work to do. Janelle and Christina will say more about this in their remarks. But you know, instead of casting a wide net, we need to lean into some of the core audiences, primarily Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and young voters. These audiences make up the new American majority, the coalition that is leading America forward, both politically and culturally. And they are called the new American majority for a reason because combined, all of the eligible voters in this demographic category make up more than 50% of eligible voters in America. The problem is they don't vote, uh, they, don't, they don't all vote and they always, they don't vote all the time, right? Um, there are many reasons and they are varied. We can get more into that on another call. We could spend the entire call talking about that. Um, but I'm sure that you know some of these people. I know I do for sure. People who, for whatever reason, um, you know, opt out of our electoral process. Many of the voters, you know, get written off by organizations and campaigns who determine that they're too hard to reach or too expensive to mobilize. Our belief is that the traditional tactics simply are not connecting with them in ways and with words that inspire them to get involved. That's where culture comes in. Culture is the key to unlocking their engagement. So instead of thinking about these potential voters in purely demographic categories, I wanna encourage us to think about them in terms of the ways in which they see the world. As creatives, as storytellers, and as cultural strategists, we know that stories are how people make sense of the world. If we understand those stories, we can better reach and motivate these voters. To do so, Culture Surge uses a research framework called Story at Scale. Next slide. In short, Story at Scale uh, is a large scale research project to understand audiences and you know, the narratives that um, animate and motivate them. What I like about Story at Scale is that it allows us to focus on a variety of persuadable audiences. For this conversation, I'm going to lean into three. Um, kids First, Justice Rising, and For the Win. By directing our content towards these audiences, we believe we can yield higher engagement levels more than ever before. Kids First, uh, they are an audience that is made up primarily of parents and grandparents who want their kids to grow up well. They're mostly older, mostly women, most, you know, about 40% African American. They live in the Deep South and West Texas. They're frequent, progressive voters. They trust Oprah. They love Michelle Obama and Kathy Lee Gifford. Don't ask why. Uh, they like brands like Hallmark and Publix and Kohl's. Justice Rising, they're creative leftists who want safety and freedom. They're diverse, they're mostly women, they're very young. College towns and coastal cities is where they reside. They're progressive voters when they vote, but turn out um, in lower average uh, than some of their uh, counterparts. These are people who are influenced folks, uh, by folks like Rihanna and Lizzo and Greta, and they love Marvel and Bombas and Fenty Beauty. I like Fenty Beauty too, but I, I live in the kids first uh, frame. <laughs> For the win, they're leaders who want to have a good time and to win, they're young, they're diverse, they're widespread with concentration in the South. They rarely vote. And these folks like folks like Cam Newton and Elon Musk and Cardi B, and they like brands like Nike and Red Bull and Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, as you are creating content this year, these are the audiences that I encourage you to think about and to direct your content towards. You can find more um, in this sort of in-depth profiles on storyatscale.org that will equip you in creating content for these specific audiences. Culture Search will be providing uh, additional data and research to help assist you uh, in doing so.
Because the truth of the matter is we can't afford for our content to be anything less than precise. We can't afford to write off potential voters because they're quote unquote too hard. You know, other folks are campaigning 24 seven from the White House. And as I said before, the Russians are coming. So people are at home, they're tuned into their screens for connection and information. And that means we need more content now more than ever before. We have to flood the airwaves. We have to flood the social media feeds, every content distribution channel you can possibly think of with two types of content. Next slide. The first type of content is content that clearly explains how, when, and where people can vote this November. That's the first kind. The second is content that is about reimagining what life looks like on the other side of all of this. The sort of content that wakes up someone's desire for answers, for solutions, for a new way of dealing with the pandemic and its aftermath, for a new way of addressing racial injustice in this country. The sort of content that wakes up their belief that things could actually be better for them personally. I believe that the only thing, and that is the only thing, that is going to motivate people to vote this year. And that is why Culture Search created the Storyteller's Guide to Changing Our World, a resource for creatives of all types that explore a core story and six storytelling threads that research and experience tells us will motivate these critical audiences in this election and beyond. And you can find that guide on our website, culturesearch.org. Uh, the guide is meant to be used by you, the artists, storytellers, and communicators to help us tell a shared story that makes a better, more just, and joyful, dare I say joyful, future feel tangible and possible. And that is our job as storytellers, as cultural strategists. And that is the most important task for us between now and November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, I could listen to you all day, lady. Uh, I want to be Tracy when I grow up. <laughs> Who wants to join me? All right, well, we have another brilliant uh, woman that is going to join us right now. And I am so honored to introduce our, our next speaker, who's electoral strategist, Christina Oribe, who's the director of civic engagement at the Center for Cultural Power. And Christina is a veteran political strategist and manager at the intersection of advocacy and politics. She's held a senior, senior management roles at several organizations, including the Cal California Director Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, Senior Advisor for Strategic Initiatives at the National Education Association, and Western Regional Director at EMILY's List. She's led campaigns and civic engagement efforts in dozens of state and states across the country. And throughout her career, Christina has worked to drive political change at the local, state, and national level. Christina, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Crystal. I'm happy to be joining everyone from Ohlone land here in Oakland, California. And I am just going to jump right into picking up where um, my friend and colleague Tracy, I want to be on like the Tracy Sturt event like tour, um, <laughs> the Zoom tour, since we can't be traveling the country right now, but really just going to jump into um, focusing on a few states. And I just want to say something really quickly when we talk about swing states, right? It's anywhere from seven to 12. We're highlighting five in particular where Culture Surge and many of um, the anchor partners are focusing in on states like Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Carolina, and Georgia. But just something to keep in mind, I've been doing this for a long time, if you couldn't tell from my bio that Crystal just shared. And I would just say like, the fact that Arizona and Georgia and North Carolina are in a swing state conversation, um, as my colleague Jessica Bird would say, you know, movement did that. It is the work that happens in the intervening years, the stories we tell, um, the worlds we're shaping and creating that create the context for change to be possible. When 10 years ago, SB 1070 passed in Arizona, the show me your papers bill, the groups that emerged from that fight in that resistance um, in Arizona groups like Lucha and One Arizona are the exact same groups are engaging these hard to reach, um, often um, disenfranchised, marginalized voters that Tracy talks about, right? Um, organizations in 
Wisconsin, like Lit Milwaukee and Block, um, We the People in Michigan, Blueprint North Carolina, which is really the blueprint for so many of us on how to do civic engagement and build power and build relationships. The New Georgia Project to a lot of folks, if you didn't know about them before, you saw them highlighted in, in She the People, right? These are the organizations that are responding to what Tracy talked about in her opening, right? To COVID, to meeting people where they are, who a lot of folks like to talk about relational organizing for old heads like myself, organizing is being in relationship to people, right? So they're the folks who are responding with mutual aid to assist folks. Um, it happening. It wasn't, can I talk to you about voter reg today? It was, um, how are you doing with your student loans? Do you know where to get resources for that? Um, people delivering meals to folks uh, in these communities, folks trying to put them in contact with resources. And I think that's important as we think about like these swing states, states that can really um, shift the future of our country, um, who are in the balance, who on a, election night, um, people will be thinking about and watching for what is happening in those states. Um, you know, I would, it's, we know that COVID has impacted all of our lives. So yeah, it's like voter registration, I would say from a kind of what has been most impacted on voter engagement on the ground, voter registration is the most site-based activity that we do in our world. So all these organizations had strategies that they've been working on and implementing really since last September. When March came, the strategy, strategy didn't change, but the tactic, tactics had to. And voter reg, thankfully, these groups were you know, registering record numbers of young people, young, black, indigenous, people of color um, that Tracy talked about in this new American majority. You know, We had really good numbers on the voter reg side between January and March. But when we look at the numbers from March to June, once you register to vote, you're on a list. So we know how to find you. We can talk to you, we can engage you, we can send you a text, right? We can, in the old days, knock on your door. Um, but trying to find those people when we're not doing site-based activity to register has definitely been a challenge and organizations have been doing what we're doing, right? They're, they're doing Zoom meetups. They're engaging folks that they were already talking to to bring their friends into the voter registration um, um, activities. But the challenge is, as, as Tracy said, right? Like, not having those people register to vote when they are critical, when they are, are the folks that we really want to engage and, and have um, to sign up to vote by mail and to vote early and to really turn out on election day, that is a challenge. It, it increases the work for the organizations I mentioned in the states. And so the voting barrier is really COVID in many ways, right? And we know that conservative and right-wing organizations are using COVID as an opportunity to further suppress the vote and disenfranchise people while we're all trying to think about how do we use this opportunity to enfranchise more people um, in this conversation. And so if we just want to go to the um, next slide, because I know a lot of folks are going to have questions. One of the things um, that is a challenge, right, in all of these states, like I wish I could tell you that we use the same voter registration, vote by mail, early vote rules, um, election day rules it, across the country, but we have 50 different um, kind of ways of how we administer elections. The one thing that is universal that Tracy talked about that all the organizations are focused on is the fact that we need to make voting um, as safe and accessible, um, secure, um, for as many people as possible and, and fair. And I just want to say, you know, one thing particularly about vote by mail, which, you know, has really entered everyone's lexicon in a way that it hadn't before, that is not a panacea for many of our communities. Um, we know there are challenges for vote by mail, especially for Native American and Indigenous communities where there's requirements on physical addresses versus PO boxes. We know young people who are registering to vote for the first time and then voting by mail for the first time often have their ballots um, challenged based on archaic rules around signature matching and things like that, that often then their vote gets discarded, getting to Tracy's point around distrust around voting by mail. So while it is important for as many folks like you and I, I've always been a, a day of poll voter, like I'm gonna vote by mail this day, so then I'm freeing up room in that line for people who do have to show up and vote in person on election day. And I just think that's really important for us to remember our job is to figure out how we enfranchise as many people as possible in this process, not to use tools exclusively that might disenfranchise one community over the other. And if you've been voting for a long time, I will say this, like I've never voted by mail. It's gonna be a new process for me. I've been voting since I was 18. Imagine never having voted before and you're gonna introduce this 
this process to, to people. So I think that's like one thing we're seeing consistently in every state. Um, the other thing that I just wanna say around like what our, what our job is, how you all can be involved in doing this, which is we wanna create a culture from this point. Like there are three, if there's like three things that you take away from what I have to say, it's these, which is we wanna make voting celebratory. We know that when we do that, when we create a culture of voting, that people are more likely, especially young black indigenous people of color, they're more likely to engage in the process. Um, we don't want to shame voters. That does not, that does not work. Um, to quote Stacey Abrams, like it is our job, it's your job. This is why artists and creatives are so critical. We need to give people a reason to believe that participating makes a difference that by participating, we're gonna create the future we want. You all need to help us create that, right? There is a need since everything is kind of digital focus to help people create that vision. The last thing I'll say is, if you are creating and putting content in this world, please, 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 as Tracy also mentioned, provide links to trusted resources. Um, don't tell people their vote's not going to count. Don't tell people that their ballot's going to get thrown out. Give them a resource. So if you're trying to bring people in and give them a call to action, make sure they have links so they know the dates. Every state deadline is different. Make sure they have a link to where they can register to vote. Make sure they know, especially young voters, like sign up to be a poll worker. We are going to have to have people vote in person. And we know a lot of people who work as poll workers tend to be older and more at risk. For, for COVID, right? So like, encourage them to sign up to be a poll worker, um, give them a hotline to call with questions. And again, just always link to trusted resources. One of the things that gave me a heart attack in the last couple of days was seeing this meme go around of like October 20th is the last day to mail your ballot in. If you don't, it won't count, pass it on. And that was it. And I was like, no, if you're a voter in California, votes here can be postmarked on election day. Again, it's different in every state. So help us create a culture of voting, um, give people um, a reason to believe that participating makes a difference, and then share links to trusted resources, which I know Janelle is going to get into um, as well. So I'll just stop there and hand it back to Crystal. Thank you so much, Christina. I really appreciate that really important information. And so now we're going to turn it oh, things over to Janelle uh, Tribitz, who is the Culture Surge's network manager, to talk about, uh, about how Culture Surge is coordinating the cultural strategy field in ways that you can get involved. And Janelle is a cultural strategist. She's a political organizer and a puppeteer. She has 15 years of experience collaborating with local and national social justice organizations and grassroots campaigns, helping them to incorporate cultural strategies and creative tactics into their work. So Janelle, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks so much, Crystal. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to be sharing Culture Surge's activities over the next 100-ish days. As Crystal said, we're supporting and coordinating networks of influencers, artists, and content creators to increase our collective impact on this election cycle. And because it's not just political change we're after, but also cultural change, we want to use this election cycle to build support for a just, equitable, joyful, as Tracy said, society where everyone can thrive. Next slide. To help us get at that broader future-oriented goal, we've created the Storyteller's Guide for Changing Our World. Um, and Tracy already mentioned this, but I'm really gonna reiterate it. The guide aims to help creators tell a shared story about what we stand for and the kind of future vision we want to manifest. And as mentioned, it's a resource for all types of creatives, and we hope that you'll use it and read it. Erin, our fearless cultural strategy lead, will put the link in the chat for you. Uh, but you can also find it on our website under the learn more section. Next slide. As we've been talking to organizers on the ground and reviewing all that we know from civic engagement research, there are three things that really jumped out at us. One is that mail-in voting is a new process for many and the process varies by locality, as Christina just talked about. People need more and better information to navigate requesting a mail-in ballot and getting it in on time. Number two is that peer-to-peer -peer contact is one of the most effective ways to encourage voting in this election. Peer-to-peer -peer contact is when folks reach out to their friends or family to remind them to register to vote. We've seen that it's actually way more effective than hearing uh, voter registration plugs from other sources or even voter turnout. If you hear from somebody you know and trust, mm -hmm. it really is motivating. Um, the last mm -hmm. thing, number three, 
that people are more inclined to vote if they feel their civic participation is impacting issues they care about in their communities. And this pandemic has forced organizers to pivot towards finding new ways of reaching their audiences. And as a network of artists, we are uniquely positioned to help with that. So audience engagement, content creation, and creative engagement are our strengths, and they're especially needed right now. But because we're trying to impact voter turnout at the end of the day, we also want to make sure our content is geared to inspire specific actions. Next slide. So here's what we want our audiences to do. One, register to vote. Two, make a mask or mail plan. That's a current a term coined by Tracy Sturdivant. Um, so we want them to either request a mail-in ballot or make a plan to vote in person while wearing a mask and keeping themselves safe, either early or on November 3rd. The third thing is we want them to know the voter info and access hotline, 1-866-OUR-VOTE, which is also a website. And the fourth is we want them to form vote squads of three or more people who are doing and navigating all of this together. That's where we get at that peer-to-peer -peer contact. So not every piece of content needs to ask folks to do all of these things, but we wanna make sure that across all the content we're creating, all of these critical calls to actions are covered. Now let's talk about content creation more specifically. We wanna encourage the artists in our network, which includes all of you artists who are on this call, to create. More is more in this moment. Next slide. So we are developing creative prompts to help inspire content. We want to create an easy, accessible invitation for folks to participate in creation. And I wanna give you a few examples of what these prompts might be, but you all probably have a lot of other ideas. We're working with a group of comedians right now to organize a 60 second comedy challenge, inviting other comedians to do something funny or outlandish or completely mundane for 60 seconds with an ending line like, if you can watch me do this thing for one minute, you can take one minute to register to vote. We're gonna be approaching professional sportscasters to video themselves doing play-by-plays of a family member filling out a voter registration form. We're gonna be approaching musicians about writing songs, explaining how to request a mail-in ballot. And we know that how-tos will be especially necessary to help folks navigate the process of voting by mail or voting early. So we're thinking about enlisting beauticians to work voting instructions into beauty tip videos, or enlisting chefs to present voting instructions in a cooking show style, or enlisting video gamers to use their videos about sharing gaming hacks to also talk about voting. We're also just starting to think about what prompts would look like for visual artists. And we're open to suggestions. As culture makers, we need to think, we need to make content that's aspirational and inspirational, as Tracy said, or fun and celebratory, as Christina said. I think the creative prompts really speak to that like combination of fun and celebratory to get at that informational piece that people need. And the storyteller's guide really gets at the aspirational and inspirational. And these are just some of the ideas we've come up with or that creators in our network are working on, but we really need more artists to create around these and other ideas. So we invite you to talk to your networks, talk to your collaborators, come up with prompts that work for your folks, and then send us your content. Mm -hmm. So Aaron's gonna be putting our email address in the chat so that you can be in touch. Next slide. And that leads me to the next major piece of our work, which is Surge Weeks. This is what all this frenzy of content creation will feed into. Surge Weeks are basically cultural weeks of action mm -hmm. built around four keystone moments in the election cycle. We wanna help promote content that is created around the story threads in our storyteller's guide and content that uplifts any of our audience calls to action in the next hundred days. We're working with media partners and influencers and we'll be doing some paid media mm -hmm. as well to help distribute some of the content that emerges from you and from our network. These surge weeks are when we'll be launching this flood of content that will build momentum towards November 3rd. Our first surge week overlaps with the DNC and RNC and we'll focus on voter registration as a call to action. In September, our surge week mm -hmm. surrounds the National Voter Registration Day and we'll focus both on voter registration and vote by mail. Our October surge week will surround vote early day and will be about voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And our final surge week will straddle election day on November 3rd and focus both on turnout beforehand and likely on protecting our democracy afterwards. We know that this year's process of counting votes will likely take days, and I hate to be pessimistic, but anything can happen. Um, next slide. 
The last thing I want to share about our work is that we're building partnerships in five swing states, where, as Christina mentioned, collective efforts can make an outsized impact. So that's Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. We'll focus a large amount of our distribution in those states, and we're working to partner with grassroots groups and local artist networks to design creative prompts that address the specific grassroots needs and voter barriers for those states. We're compiling a list of artists and influencers in each of these states, and we'd actually love help with that. Erin's gonna put the link to that list in the chat. If any of you have artist or influencer relationships in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, or Wisconsin, please add them to our list. We'd really appreciate it. Next slide. So to all of you artists, strategists, communications professionals, me makers, or just like any of you who wanna help us build that better future we need, please join us, create, check out our storyteller's guide, sign up through our join us form and get looped into what we're doing. And please, please, if you make content that uses our guide or uplifts any of our calls to action, email it to us, we wanna know about it. Um, that is all I have for you, thank you so much. Um, and we really hope to hear from you. I'm gonna turn this back over to Crystal. Thank you so much, Janelle, for all that great information. And so now we're gonna uh, jump into some uh, Q&A. And so just really wanna remind you all to drop your questions into the chat box to Aaron Potts and questions. And um, we're gonna spend some time with these brilliant women um, and explore some questions here. So, um, I think one of the first questions, you know, and I, I'd love to hear both from uh, Christina and Tracy on, on this question. And I'm looking at the makeup today of, of the folks attending and it's kind of an even split between artists, storytellers and activists. And I, I guess the first question would be is, you know, what is one of the most important things that artists and story can, storytellers can do to have impact in this election? And Tracy, I'd love to start with you on that question. Create, create, create. Like, you know, as I said earlier, this is a numbers game. And, uh, you know, with less than 100 days out, like we have to get out content now, now and more of it consistent um, that, you know, some of it is evergreen, right? Like you need to vote and we know stuff about the election. And then the rest is sort of rapid response and relationship to these moments that we know are going to emerge again. Um, with the two pandemics happening and then everything else in between, like the opportunity to help thread together and connect the dots for folks is really important. So while organizations who've been accustomed to like, here are six mail pieces, we're gonna do these two door knocks, gonna text message program, <laughs> like we need more folks who are helping to inspire folks outside of that work and also working with those organizations to help fuel uh, and make their stuff just pop and sing in a way that, um, you know, is not usually they're they don't have the capacity or the imagination um, to, to work with others. And so some of that is them also sort of opening themselves up to be in partnership um, with organizations who are really interested in experimenting with engaging with artists and, and cultural strategists as well. So those are the two things um, um, that I would share. Yeah, awesome. I would just add that. Um, we all are experiencing our world right now in some various digital way. So the amount, the need for it even, like we always knew that we needed this emotionally resonant type of creativity to reach, especially young um, black indigenous people of color voters, like that age to like 18 to, to 30. Folks who are like, again, does it make a difference? Aren't they all the same? Who are in the streets protesting? So it's not, they're not disengaged from their civic lives. It is making that connection from the movement work they're engaged with currently to voting. And so as artists and creatives, it's why at the Center for Cultural Power, we're doing something called Movement to the Ballot Box and working with artists to help build that bridge to reach those voters, to create content. This is where we're really leaning on you all to create that content, to make that connection to folks from like the protests and engagement and everything they're doing right now to engaging in this election and seeing that as an extension. But yes, content, like a lot of it and creating this echo chamber to help us break through in a way that's emotionally resonant for folks. The other thing that would add, particularly for our friends who are not you know, creative strategists and artists who are, um, is, um, you know, for the activists or, you know, um, 
you know, movement leaders is to engage the artists and activists and, and, and creative um, folk uh, in your work as you're now trying to reimagine some of your work and you know, it's primarily digital or as you start trying to think about what can we do offline that is going to resonate with folks. Like, don't just try to do that in the vacuum, you know, with folks who are, you know, accustomed to sort of drafting white papers and policy, you know, briefs, bring in the artists and also pay them, right? Like their, their work um, is of value and they're, they're, you know, they're thinking or just quote unquote, picking people's brains, like that um, is worth uh, investment in as well. And so yeah, as you're creating your communications uh, line items, I would, you know, throw in a little um, around engaging creative um, cultural strategists um, to be a part of helping you think through how to actually engage um, some of these uh, communities that we're talking about today. Thank you, ladies. That's so helpful. And we just had a question come in and uh, folks are wondering if you can talk a little bit more about voter squads. Tracy, you want to take that first or? Talk about voter squads? Yeah. That might be for me, actually. Oh, okay. actually, sorry. Like, oh, like, that 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 term? Okay. <laughs> I was like, is this an extension of that Marvel group that you <laughs> talked about? It's it's term term now. <laughs> now. So vote, voter squads are um, our way of expressing that it's hard sometimes to navigate these processes alone, especially when there's new, there's deadlines at different every place. And it speaks to that peer to peer content that we know is so effective when folks who know each other come together and remind each other and hold each other accountable. So the idea of a vote squad or vote team, or honestly, whatever you want to call it, is simply the idea of us encouraging folks to find their three friends and to work together to navigate the process, to, to hold each other accountable, see the process through, and support each other to, you know, go to those trusted links, to like the trusted uh, resources to get your voter registration form, to request your mail-in ballot, and then to all make sure that you're either showing up safely at the polls together or that you're putting it in the mail. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I think, you know, I want to really just give us the opportunity. We've got some um, good time here to really just double down on this question. I mean, aside from registering to vote, but just, you know, really the, the whole issue around mail-in ballots. And, and Christina, I just want to come back to you and just give you a little bit more time because to really to talk through that a little bit more um, and just, you know, what you want to really emphasize, what you're most concerned about that you think that everyone needs to walk away with today. What's, what are those key, key takeaways on these issues? I think first, First of all, if you're already a registered voter like me, and in many states we have kind of a no excuse, right? You don't need an excuse to sign up to vote by mail. So in states that are no excuse states, which the majority of our five are like, just request a vote by mail ballot because we need to get you out of that line on election day for people who are gonna either um, show up on election day to vote for a variety of reasons, um, didn't get their ballot in time. So we know, you know, out in the ether, the US Postal Service, which is also, you know, being defunded as we speak, has said like, hey, we can't guarantee that we'll get your ballot in in time. So maybe mail it in two weeks before election date, right? So we know there are gonna be some people who actually don't even receive their ballot potentially in time to then mail it back or feel confident. And again, the rules are a little bit different. So so we're providing links and resources to what that rule looks like in your state. Do you need an excuse? What are the deadlines? Is it already postmarked? I, again, I wish we had some, sort of a universal rule across the 50 states. We don't want to add confusion. So again, I just can't emphasize that um, uh, enough. We know in the ether that there's lots of things happening around lawsuits, um, communications from the federal government about vote by mail, uh, communications from folks in state and in their counties. We want to make this as clear as possible for folks and take that noise out of this process, not reshare um, bad information because confusion will lead to disenfranchisement. So for those of us who have always been voting, are used to voting, if you haven't already, sign up to vote by mail. 
then as you're engaging folks and registering to vote immediately after, like in this voting plan, again, we're all going to talk about mask or mail because that's what Tracy's put in our heads. Like everyone's voting one or two ways, either wearing a mask on by voting early. So that's the other piece of this. Like for some folks who vote by mail may not be an option, we want them to vote early, right? We know that is happening in more and more places where starting around October 24th, right? One of our surge actions, people can go and vote early. So we want to make this as safe and accessible for for people as possible. Make sure they know the deadlines, make sure you know the deadlines in your state, and then just point people to where they can go for that. But also know that this that is not going to be an option for everyone. And that's where we want to focus, like is getting as many people into that process as possible, but then helping the people who are going to cast their ballot in person do that safely um, is, I think, kind of like our, our last piece of business. But um, yeah, it just this is new. If you've lived in a state where this has been going on for a while, this is like, why doesn't everyone vote by mail? This is so new to so many people. Um, and so our job is to inspire them, but then connect them to, to resources. Right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's like, it's even new in states like New York, right? They just yes. got absentee voting. Um, so it is a, and you know, their, their recent primary uh, you know, I live there. I didn't get my ballot when I requested. And so it's just one of those things where we know that COVID is, has changed and is going to change how government functions in this moment. And so the more that we can create clarity around how people are supposed to relate to the process this moment, that's not even including like voter purges off the rolls, you know, that's coming down the pipeline. We haven't talked, you know, in terms of voter suppression, like all of our content um, being aimed at making sure that it is crystal clear, you know, and that people, you know, everywhere they turn, they see it um, so that they can feel confident about, you know, I'm either wearing a mask or I need, I know what I need to do in order to mail this thing and to feel confident about it. So um, that's not insignificant. And that starts now because, to Christina's point, it starts out even the sort of misinformation that's out here, you know, Christy Teigen tweets out, you you know, you've got two weeks before you, you know, to, to mail you. It's like, that's actually not accurate. That's not accurate. Don't <laughs> right? do that. Yeah. It's not accurate. I mean, in theory, you're right, but that's not the law. And so even sort of best intentions of us bringing in influence, we haven't talked about, you know, sort of influencers, both macro and quote unquote micro influencers and how we utilize their platforms in helping us to tell these stories and to uh, amplify our art. You know, some of the work that we're also doing is trying to create a center of gravity so that we can arm them with information that doesn't help murky, you know, muddy up um, uh, the waters as much as we want to be able to, you know, engage um, um, their platforms and helping us to, you know, um, the distribution of this, which is really, really important. Thanks, ladies. We have some questions coming in. Uh, we've got one question that is, what about content for youth too young to vote? Um, and that can help them really activate their older siblings and parents. Um, is there any specific strategies or advice um, that any of you are that we're thinking about? I'll just throw out one super quick. Mi gente has done a really good job with this as it relates to um, dreamers um, and many of, of their folks who um, can't vote, right? And so this like, but they're very engaged in the voter contact and, and outreach. And so it's part of the like, this um, doing it for me right like being my voice using your power like because we don't have the power to vote yet there are tons of movements happening to actually enfranchise 16 and 17 year olds we it's happening in my home state of california we've seen it happen in Colorado and other places. But I do think like we, again, we want everyone singing the same gospel around enfranchisement and, and the inspiration and sort of what's at stake and what's possible, right? And so I do think we've seen, especially within the dreamer community, that tactic used, which I think is pretty uh, effective. Awesome. Tracy or Janelle, do you have any other ideas or thoughts on that? I mean, the one thing that I would add to this is that this moment, particularly around racial injustice, like the, the folks who are in the streets marching are young kids, young people, right? And they are the ones who are changing the hearts and minds of their parents uh, in this moment. And so I, you know, I think that continuing to promote 
um, you know, and as, you know, I talked about this sort of audience segmentation. So this sort of justice rising crew, like that is an audience who for sure, the sort of Gen Z and younger, um, who are already activated and finding the, whether it's TikTok and then, well, maybe it's not TikTok because they, they got their own problems as I mentioned <laughs> earlier, but <laughs> going to the places where we know they are congregating, um, you know, it's the, uh, um, you know, the kids who are, you know, buying up all of the tickets to the rally in Tulsa, <laughs> right? They are already organizing themselves. And so being able to arm them with content um, that feels uh, organic, I think definitely is a strategy that we should lean more into. And I know there are a handful of organizations that are focused on young people who could be really interesting, um, you know, distribution partners for content. Awesome. I'll just mention maybe one more example. One of my favorites uh, it's from Ireland when they were having a, a referendum around uh, marriage equality. And they had this whole campaign of Ring Your Granny. And so it was about young folks calling their grandparents or parents and they video themselves doing it and then post it. And so that was, um, it was an easy way. And it was, but it was like modeling the behavior that you're kind of hoping the kids will do and giving kids a way to do it themselves and like show themselves doing it. And that was, it's the, they're pretty great videos. If you want to look it up, ring your granny. Awesome. All right. We've got two more questions that I want to get through in the next couple minutes before we start to move to close out. Um, one of them is, are there any efforts to collaborate with faith-based faith -based organizations? Yeah, I mean, I'll just really yeah. quickly, obviously, Reverend Barber and, and his, his, you know, people's um, campaign that he's been leading forever out of North Carolina, but it's nationwide. I also would say Faith in Public Life, um, uh, who does a lot of work with, with faith leaders across the country from and really view their organizing as a cultural strategy, kind of progressive organizing. I do think like thinking about culture broadly and how, but again, they're trying to figure out how that gets translated. So I, I do think, um, and then obviously there's just a, a huge tradition, especially in places like, you know, um, in, in Georgia where it's like, you know, um, from the pulpits to the polls, right? Like there are longstanding organizing traditions in many of our faith communities that are engaging around this. So I, I definitely think that's something we can dive deeper into SC Trace with our finger. <laughs> no, that finger is me telling my kid to go back upstairs now. <laughs> Sorry. I thought that was a testimonial, Tracy. No, I thought you were getting ready to testify. That, that was me. I was, he's going to need some faith if he comes back over here. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to end on this question, and I think it also serves to kind of give a wrap-up point. But we got a question in that I think is a play. It, it's regarding artists, but I think it really is across the board for all of us. And the question here is that sometimes artists can get blocked because of all the negative news going on in the world, which can make it really hard to create. And the small wins help, but are there any other kind of recommendations or words of wisdom for artists to get out of them feeling stuck? And I think that can be all of us because it, it feels like bombs are sort of going off every minute. Um, and so I just want to ask each of you just to take like a minute or less to kind of those final words of wisdom um, as we enter into this, this less than now 100 days. Um, I'm going to start with Tracy. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I've been doing in the midst of this um, is a sort of Facebook live show with a handful of Black women leaders um, that we call The Sip. We um, air on Facebook, you know, a couple of times a week. Judy Brown, Diana's from the Advancement Project, Glenda Carr from Higher Heights, Fatima Goss Grace from the National Women's Law Center, and Adrian Shropshire from Black Pack. And we started it as a way to just talk about issues that were impacting Black women in the midst of COVID. Um, but we wanted it to not only be a place where we talk about politics, but we also talk about culture. And I would say what the thing that has been most interesting as we like, you know, analyze our viewership is that for the, the days that we do content that is about wellness are the days where folks really tuned in and watch, you know, for the longest period of time. And I say that because this is an unprecedented time and we're all exhausted and like burnt out and like all of the things. Um, and I, you know, artists are a part of that. Real people, you know, are a part of that. And so, you know, some of this is about like, what does it mean to have self-care in this moment? And 
what are the things that we're talking about that are about, um, again, looking at the other side of this, like what do we need to take care of ourselves and our families, not just in this moment, but for the long haul. And so if we're actually a sort of checking in with ourselves and making sure that we're doing the things that bring us joy, even in the midst of, you know, a global pandemic and also helping to project that we're all in this together and that there is some a collective action of one of which of the things is voting in this moment, that there is a real opportunity for us to get on the other side of this together. So that is the thing that I would offer up, like, like speak your truth seriously. And I've got to go on mute because my kid is, he doesn't speaking care. His truth. <laughs> He's speaking his truth. I'll just add real quickly, um, just amen to everything Tracy said, but also, um, in that like small wins, I don't ever discount that because every big systemic change comes from all of those quote, small wins. And I don't want to be part of a joyless movement. So I think it is important to celebrate all of that. So when the Oakland Unified School District just dis invested from our police um, department just a few weeks ago, that was 10 years of the Black Organizing Project doing that. We see it had in Milwaukee, like, celebrate that do what chase so like take a time out and acknowledge that i mean you know there is always like before every big moment there are lots of boring and unattractive and uninspiring work that is happening to make those moments happen so i actually do think like lean into that joy and celebrate every single movement to bring that into this work thank you so janelle i'm going to turn it to you about you know what's next yeah, so um, we are, we're raring to go. We are excited to connect with you. Uh, if you are organizers, we're excited to connect with you. If you're con content creators, we want content. We wanna know if folks um, are involved in any of these states and wanna, wanna jump on board and collaborate with us. So email us, um, maybe Erin, could you put the email, our email back in there? Please read our storyteller's guide. I think speaking to like that last question, the storyteller's guide offers that aspirational, inspirational vision of who we can be and who, where we wanna go, um, the future that we need. And I think that creating from that space, um, I, I find that fulfilling. I feel thinking about building the future I want to be fulfilling. And so I think that's, we really encourage you all to look at that storyteller's guide and join us in our creative prompts and talk to your folks and figure out how you all would want to be involved and let us know when there's content. So that's, those are our next steps. And mark that those surge weeks in your calendar. Um, we'll be trying to put a lot of stuff out in the world and would love help uplifting and amplifying it. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. I want to, if we could like, I wish I had that applause dial, but I just want to turn it up. If we can all turn it up wherever we're at for these three incredible women and just the information that, that was shared and just really want to, you know, say thank you to all of you. I know we're all busy. We're all zoomed out. Um, so just creating and taking this space for 60 minutes to come together in this circle and really talk about this moment, you know, and it's been incredible over the last 60 some odd days um, to watch everything unfold and to watch people take the streets and to watch monuments build and, and things literally, you know, structural racism start to begin to fall around us in all these moments. But this is our time. This is really our time. And this is with the greatest intention that we need to make sure that we take this magic movement moment and really ensure that it leads to the kind of transformative change that we're all hungry for and that we need. And, and so, but just one as a reminder, you know, as, as Tracy was you know, telling us, it's, it's also about self-care. It's the and in there with our, with our work and, and our intention um, and about how we're gonna do this, this work together. And so I just, we send the best to all of you. We hope you will continue to stay engaged. Please join us at Culture Surge. Please join us in these, these, these magic movement moments that are going to be coming up over the next 90 some odd days. And we're, we're really excited and we can do this together. So wish you all well and take good care and we will see you all soon.